Hi everyone, thanks for joining us for the webinar, the final one in our series for the week. I uh, just want to let you all know we're going to be starting in about two minutes while we wait for some latecomers, so we will talk to you real soon. All right, hello everyone. A uh, few of you already know what I'm going to say because you've been on so many of these in this series this week, which is really great to see. Uh, first of all, I just want to make sure the audio is working okay. So if you don't mind to just go ahead and say your name and where you're watching from and the questions or the chat window, whatever works, that'd be great. Second, uh, you know, this whole series has really been about Jenkins. And so Jenkins World is the event for if you're looking to expand your knowledge and learn from the masters. And registration went live today. So in the chat window, I just put a link as well as a discount code. It's going to get you a registration for 399, which will end on November 30th. And that is going to be the cheapest you're going to find. So if you're interested in going now, it's the time to definitely get in there. Uh, after, beyond that, I'm about to put another piece in the chat window that's going to go on Twitter. So I'm going to give everyone a second to get their Twitter up if you're interested. You send this tweet out and keep that hashtag intact. The first five people are going to win a t-shirt. So I'm going to wait just a second and posting it. Now, we are recording. So if you have a colleague who is missing this, we will be able to get that recording to them very soon. Uh, the follow-up email should be going out tomorrow or Monday with all the links and everything. You should be all set. Uh, you're welcome to reply to that uh, email that you got, the confirmation email, or the reminder emails, that'll come right to me. I also put my email address in the chat box in case you have any questions or like to follow up on anything after the fact. Uh, you can ask questions as well. We have time at the end to go over questions. We love to see them. So at any time, if you have one, please put it right in there. Don't worry about feeling like you may not have time to answer it or that it will be answered later. If it's answered later, so on, so be it. But we will be able to take things offline if we can't get to them. So, you know, please put it right in there. Uh, I don't want to take up too much time at the start of this because we do have a lot to go over. So I would like to introduce our two speakers who I'm really excited to have on with us, uh, Karine and Karan from uh, Care First for Reimagining Software Development at Care First FEP Operations Center. Thank you, Max. Um, welcome to the session on Reimagining Software Development at Care First FEP Operations Center. Uh, my name is Kirian, Kirian John, uh, Systems Development Manager at CareFirst FEPOC. Um, a little bit about us, uh, we are a subsidiary of CareFirst Blue Cross Blue Shield, which is a health insurance provider in the Mid-Atlantic region. Uh, we are a technology partner for the Blue Cross Blue Shield Federal Employee Program that covers roughly 5.3 million members all across the U.S. And um, I was fortunate to be part of the DevOps journey and the Azure journey at CareFirst FEPOC right from the beginning. With that, I would like to hand over to Karan. Hey, my name is Karan Kerr, and I'm an uh, architect uh, slash engineer, and I've also been uh, part of the DevOps journey for our company since the beginning. And we're happy to be able to share this 
journey with you guys. So we'd like to thank uh, Claudine for allowing us to do that. All right. A uh, little bit about the agenda. Uh, in the session, uh, we want to share the lessons that our IT teams learned in the journey to embrace DevOps principles while attempting to improve delivery agility. Uh, we'll also discuss how our teams shifted left on various platform level concerns, optimize our internal IT processes, use different tools as enablers, and in, in fact started a cultural transformation. As you know, we are in a highly regulated industry. Currently, we don't have the use case of pushing code into production tens or hundreds of times a day like the unicorns in the industry like Google and Amazon. But we did have to adopt Agile and DevOps principles to meet the need of our customers and our business. So let's start the session by taking a look at, at what drove us towards this journey. So here are our business drivers. What we see is our business needs are going up. So our new development initiatives saw three to four times growth in the past five years compared to the prior five years. Uh, what that means is we have a lot of concurrent projects in execution. Um, our solution complexity has gone up. Uh, we had a heavy mainframe footprint 10 to 15 years back. Uh, we have a more heterogeneous technology stack now that consists of mainframe, distributed platforms, web, mobile, big data, APIs, microservices, you name it. Um, so the solution complexity is going up. There's a lot more integration needs. Um, environments that we build uh, need to have all these technology stacks. And we do have 50 plus full stack non-production environments that we have to maintain to support the increased volume of development effort. And each of these environments have 100 plus applications and dependent systems that include mainframe database, message queues, et cetera, et cetera. So our infrastructure complexity also has gone up. And more work meant more people and more handoffs. And what we discovered is things were not scaling as we expected. And unplanned work was causing stress into our teams. On top of that, our time to market expectations uh, have gone up. So some of the, our initiatives wanted new features to go to market on a monthly cadence. We used to release software on a quarterly cadence a while back, and that too with a six to nine month cycle time. Um, so our planning cycles have to come down from six, nine months to a month uh, to support some of those initiatives. Also, during this time, um, we came up with new ways of doing product delivery, where we really pull the customer and end users forward and make them an integral part of the product development phase. So end users are now part of our feature discovery process, feature prioritization process, our sprint of program increment reviews, and we do give them a sandbox environment where they can test they can experience the new functionality after each iteration. And we will take that feedback to evolve the product in the right direction. So all of this um, needs us to have the ability to push features in small, predictable, and quick increments, not all the time to production, but to a large number of downstream environments. And we do have to do that in a predictable, consistent, and efficient way. Next slide, please. So, here are, the, here are the first steps we took. As I said, uh, we did have to um, improve our planning cycle time. This, in fact, happened in our digital experience program about four or five years back. And that program, the business owners needed to have the ability to respond to the market better. We tried to band-aid our waterfall process initially to deal with the changing business priorities, but that did not really work out over long term. So we introduced Agile, and that was a change for us. Uh, it was a change to the company, um, and it took us a while to stabilize that. Um, but what we did see is we improved the planning cycle time. We were able to absorb changing requirements better. Uh, but there was one problem. The customers uh, still did not get their capabilities um, on after every sprint. They still got them on a quarterly cadence, which in fact delayed the user feedback from the operational environment. Uh, so we asked ourselves, I mean, what do we have to do to make sure that we can flow the finished products to the customer's hands better, right, faster? Uh, what do we do about the downstream processes? Next slide, please. So the lesson learned was uh, delivery agility requires more than embracing Scrum. 
So on one side, we have the customers who want to see customer value flowing fast to them, new features, enhancements, and what have you. And what we found is we are unable to release them that quickly. You know, our processes mindset was geared towards predictable releases on a longer cadence which, with big batch sizes. And the transaction cost to flow work from dev to production, the last mile, was high. And some of this was due to manual steps along the way, like manual regression test, manual way of uh, creating and configuring servers, uh, low levels of unit test automation, et cetera, et cetera. And, and as you all know, before we release to production, we need to ensure that the current functionality is not broken. And for those solutions and applications that have been uh, operational for a while, it has a large code base, large number of dependencies. Some of them could be monoliths. And that can be hard. That can be hard. So we had to tackle all of this friction if we had to be successful in releasing value to the end, end users quickly. Next slide, please. So we came up with the following enterprise objectives. Uh, we wanted to improve the speed of delivery to the end user, not just the speed of delivery from an agile team to the next phase, but to every, every step along the way. We wanted to be uh, able to do it faster and more predictably. And we wanted to improve organizational throughput. In other words, do more with less. We realized that we simply cannot scale our way by leveraging more and more people as we execute more and more volume of work and projects. Uh, in fact, when there are more people, there are more handoffs, more communication needed, and we saw that uh, there is a downward spiral that can result from that. So we had to optimize our end-to-end -end value stream and look at areas where delays were occurring, where unplanned reworks were occurring, figure out the root causes and make improvements on a continuous basis. Improve quality. We wanted to make sure that the quality did not suffer as we attempted more and more complex projects and releases, and as we tried to be faster from a time to market standpoint. Um, and as we embraced uh, newer technologies and more integration points internally and with our external partners. And while we did all, this, all of this, we wanted to make sure that we had improved predictability and reliability. Next slide, please. So here is uh, the high-level approach that we came up with about two years back. Uh, the first thing is to apply systems thinking, um, optimize the whole, not just one piece of the entire value stream. So we decided to map our end-to-end -end value streams. Um, there's no point doubling the number of our Agile teams if individual Agile teams are spending 50% of their time waiting on other teams for dependencies. We wanted to figure out where those wait times were, where the constraints were, and we wanted to address those before we, um, before we improve what was already working well. Um, improve flow. We wanted to make sure, we wanted to, we wanted to know how much time we were spending waiting or on non-customer value-added work and see how we could improve that. These are ideas from Liam Kahneman, and a lot of times we had to look at areas where action is not happening. We wanted to reduce delays in our value stream and improve flow efficiency. So our, some of the ways were reduce wait times between internal processes, reduce the number of manual processes, reduce batch size to improve cycle times. The third thing there was decoupled architecture. Uh, we do have a lot of monolith applications with highly coupled subsystems. And small changes needed large testing effort. And because of these interdependencies between our subsystems, we had to coordinate across different teams to make simple changes. And because we didn't know if that change impacted these other subsystems or those teams. And these interdependencies were impacting our delivery agility. So we decided to embrace decoupled architecture, well-defined interfaces, and microservices to improve agility. So right now we have, we started with zero microservices, we have 30 plus microservices in our company right now, uh, in a span of two years. We decided to use tools as enablers um, in order to visualize the entire value stream and enable fast feedback at every leg in our process. 
and enable different functional areas like development, testing, infrastructure, etc., to take shared accountability, we had to bring in new tools as enablers. And we'll go through more details in the next slides. And to bring better predictability, consistency, and improve feedback loops, we introduced automation in different areas like testing, infrastructure provisioning, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And we'll talk about that also in the coming slides. Next slide, please. All right. So here are the high-level changes that we introduced at the enterprise level. We embraced a philosophy of reimagining our processes, reimagining the way we do work, simplify our processes, eliminate processes that doesn't make sense, and optimize them wherever possible. And the four high-level uh, practices we adopted is continuous integration practice. Um, and, you know, we had CI servers, you know, for a while now, but um, we realized that we were not embracing continuous integration as a practice, which is beyond just having a CI server and letting it automatically kickstart builds. We had to work very hard on instilling this as a practice to shift left, get early feedback for our delivery teams, and in fact, not a culture that embraced this practice at each team level. And we'll cover more of that in the next slides. The second thing was test automation, and this is very key to delivery agility. Um, we did have automation in the past, but it was happening a little bit late, late in the game, usually a couple of iterations behind. And we had to change that by making it part of each sprint, which allowed us to shift left and get early and frequent feedback. And in fact, these test cases that we automated became part of the regression suite, and that allowed our teams to move fast and more predictably. The third idea we embrace is deployment pipelines. And, you know, if you look at our flow of work from development all the way to production, there are a lot of processes and tools that enable that. And there are, there's a lot of handoffs too uh, between different teams. It was very hard to tie all of this together to understand where things were at any given moment. So we embraced the idea of deployment pipeline to visualize the flow of finished work, enable push button deployments, and have different levels of commit phases as we move from left to right on value delivery. And each commit phase as you go from left to right, on the left would be super fast, like unit test cases that run in seconds, to on the right we'll have regression suites that take a lot more time. So we hooked up our automated test suites to our deployment pipeline, and we're also looking at how to integrate security scans into our pipeline as part of shifting left on security. The last idea we want to talk about is infrastructure as code. Um, we had to get away from manual installs and configurations to improve speed and consistency and reduce the handoffs. And uh, we wanted to make sure that we created a platform where development security operations folks could talk, could talk early, plan often, and excuse me, solve things together. And Infrastructure as a code, code gives us uh, a shared platform to contribute together and propagate changes predictably and fast. With that, I would like to hand this to Karan. Okay, thanks, Karan. So now that we've talked about uh, what some of our motivations were, let's talk about some of the things that we did on the ground to move forward. And one of the things that we did first was to understand the lead times. Uh, this diagram here is kind of my attempt at coming up with a value stream diagram, and it's not, uh, it's not as accurate as some of our actual processes that exist. Those are much more complicated. It's also not to scale, but it kind of does bring forth, it, it exhibits some of the concerns that we were able to look at. And the little uh, legend on the bottom left shows that everything in blue is manual, everything in orange is automated, and everything in yellow is weight. And if you don't even have to uh, really go through this, you'll see a lot of blue and a lot of yellow. The green arrows are handoffs and the red arrows are feedback. If we go through the left, from the left to right, what we saw was after the commits were done, our build process was actually uh, manual. It was not automated. When developers committed their code, there was nothing that was automated, automatically creating a build. It was something that was compiling the build, which was compiling the code between Jenkins, but there was a totally different tool that was actually doing the build. 
and to get a deployable artifact, the developer actually had to do some manual work. And after that artifact was built, the deployment practice, the deployment process was very, very involved. So I think there are examples of uh, it taking somewhere between 30 minutes to two hours to do one deployment. And the reason for that was that uh, the, to the deployment steps consisted of a lot of manual work, uh, creating something like build requests, copy pasting it from one place to another, a lot of user clicks, a lot of screens to go through for one deployment. And when the, build, the deployment was finally ready, which is the most of the blue part in this, the final act of deploying was just automated. And that's where the fear file or the war file was actually being propagated to the server. So it took a long time just to do the deployment. Then the testing would happen and developers would do the tests and those tests were also manual, which meant that there was not a lot of regression testing. There was some, but most of the testing that happened after the deployment was for the purpose of uh, verifying the functionality just, that just went in that commit. After that, the team would create a ticket in a different system. They would create an email, email a different team with that ticket. That team would go into the ticket and either approve or deny it, send an email back to the developers, who, by the way, in that time were just waiting. Then they would create another email and then send an email to a release management team, who would then do the deployment, go through the same kind of deployment steps. They would send the email back. And also, that during that time, the developers were waiting. And then the developers would do some shakeout and then send another email to the testers who were waiting the whole time. And then they would do some kind of a manual or automated test. And that's when the feedback went back to the developer. And the, the little gray, the gray triangle that you see was repeated for every deployment in every subsequent environment. So there was a lot of manual process and a lot of handoff, and it was repeated. So the feedback, it was, um, and the, the amount of feedback we got was just delayed by that much time after every deployment. So understanding this helped us to see where the handoffs were, where the wait times were, what the cross-team dependencies were, uh, what the manual processes were, where we could repeat things, where we could not, what was simple, what was complex. And it, it helped us to see where we should focus first to bring value to the different players in the process. Right? And in the spirit of shifting everything left and providing fast feedback. So in order to do that, in order to safely and quickly uh, deliver our code in a sustainable way, we need to look at continuous delivery as a practice. And the first step in continuous delivery was to look at continuous integration as a practice. And like we talked about earlier, it, it is actually a practice and not just letting a CI server do your build. Uh, so we didn't really reinvent anything here. We borrowed from the industry the established practices that you know, lots of companies follow. Um, and I really like this, this little image that I borrowed from ThoughtWorks because it shows the, the spirit of CI where all these little components and little teams are kind of interwoven into this, the process to form a longer process instead of one team doing this thing and then uh, waiting for feedback from the next team. So it's all about integrating faster and in, in shorter cycles. So what we did was we started to ask developers to commit often. We had cases where developers would sometimes commit after days or weeks or months. And that was partly because of their mindset, because that's what they were used to. And it was partly because of tooling, because we didn't have very user-friendly tools. And that in itself delayed the feedback because the thing that was supposed to that we were supposed to get feedback on wasn't even integrated for a long time. So committing often and actually integrating every commit. And because we committed so not so very often, uh, the time between integration or the time between creating builds was unpredictable. Sometimes we would do ten commits before we created a build. So then when we started to test that build, we would get feedback on all of those 10 things, and it became hard to figure out which commits we were getting feedback on because it was a giant thing that we were actually trying to test. So we started to see how we can integrate every commit. And for that, we started to do automated builds. So in the previous picture where we had manual builds, we turned that into automated builds. So that build would actually happen uh, almost every commit. 
and every commit actually creates a deployable build that we then release and um, deploy everywhere. We went away from the practice of creating a build and then unpackaging it with different configurations for every environment to just having a single build and maintaining its integrity as we pass it along to the environment. We also start to run these tests automatically for faster feedback. And one thing that also allowed us to do is it allowed us to become better prepared um, for emergency changes or uh, ad hoc changes because earlier, since tests run so late in the cycle, sometimes when we have to make quick changes, we didn't really think about testing uh, as a you know, as a mandatory thing. So running tests automatically um, on the CI server helped us to kind of get that discipline. And all of this put together uh, brought visibility to the entire process. Okay. Uh, so the first thing we did um, to embark on the CI CD journey was we looked at our tools. And a lot of companies start this way, they look at tools because tools are relatively easier to follow. We had pretty weak tooling. Um, we had cases where just integrating a change, a small change, was a lot more work than change, making the change itself. We had an example of a developer who was trying to add one field to an application, and it took him about a week to do that. And it's, it's also because I, I think that developer was new to the platform, so uh, that was one factor. But it also shed some light on the fact that our tooling was not as user friendly. But we needed the right tools for the job so that developers don't feel burdened, they don't feel frustrated, and they actually enjoy uh, writing their code. So some of the things we did uh, to do that was we invested in better version control tools. And one thing we did was we went from distributed or centralized to distributed version control. Because we saw that as we were growing and we needed to support a lot more teams and we needed to support their, their ability, ability to uh, work disconnected, we needed a distributed version control system. We also moved away from the archaic branching practices and some of the branching anti-patterns like keeping too many long-running branches or letting your branches become stale to more of a simpler branching model that says, you know, work on the trunk as much as possible, create branches when you need to, and keep the branches short -lived. So we actually work really closely with the teams to understand how the work flows into their teams and to come up with uh, better branching. We also started to look at uh, getting tools to do code reviews. Earlier, we were not really a code review culture. And we had to, this was also a cultural transformation where we had to get developers away from the mindset that, you know, I write code and my code is the best, and if somebody's reviewing it, they were giving me negative criticism. So we actually used tools to our advantage to shift the mindset a little bit. And we used tools to um, also get around the, the problem of finding time on people's calendars. Doing manual code reviews where you sit with somebody and look over their shoulders usually have to, you know, you have to find time on that person's calendar. Using tools, we were able to disconnect that and just open code review requests that the reviewers can look at on their own at their own convenience. Okay. Um, and the purpose of this was just to get developers to commit faster to improve the flow. The tools were just the start. What we needed was a more automated and integrated platform beyond the tools. And that's when uh, we started to look at Django. And in this in this slide, we have two systems. The one on the left was our legacy system. And I used the black box to detect this because that's kind of what it was. It was a black box. Uh, there was not a lot of visibility as to what happened inside. Once it created a build, uh, it was not easy to see how that build flowed from one environment to another. So that system, what we had, that we had also was our version control system. It created our artifacts, it propagated them. While Jenkins, on the other hand, we were only using Jenkins to um, compile, not really create the build, but just compile and um, run some unit tests. So we shifted that upside down, and we made Jenkins a first-class citizen. And what that means is we started to incorporate all of these different concerns into Jenkins. So Jenkins would do the build, it would do the test, and it would do the deploy. Uh, the manual deployment process that we talked about a couple of slides ago on slide 10, where there were too many clicks and too many buttons, 
that became just a push button deployment. Right? And what, what we saw was um, um, it significantly reduced developer overhead. And developers weren't spending 30 minutes, two hours just trying to get a deployment to take place. They could use that time and actually write code and deliver business value. Um, and it, incorporating all of that into Jenkins also increased the visibility of how work was flowing, which we didn't uh, really have before. So we took this approach and we started to look at what was working for us. So as we started using Jenkins and incorporating these things into the same place, that started to work for us and we started to roll out this new approach of development to our new team. A lot of the applications that were greenfield applications started to use this platform. And over time, what we saw was the teams that used this platform not only developed code faster and with better quality, but the developers were actually happier. Okay. A little bit about Jenkins and uh, Cloudbees and how that helped us. When we started to evaluate Jenkins, we also looked at GoCD, which is another um, um, deployment tool by software. And we really liked how GoCD treated deployment pipelines as a first class citizen. Uh, we chose to use Jenkins instead because partly because we already had it in house, but also partly because um, it gave us a better general purpose automation platform. Yeah, right? And if you look at the evolution of Jenkins, just open source Jenkins in the past three, four, or five years, the platform has really evolved from what it used to be. There's a stronger community, which grows every day. And there's a really good ecosystem of plugins. There's a plugin for everything. Uh, we don't use open source uh, Jenkins. What we use is CloudBees Jenkins platform. Uh, we use CJP and not CJE just yet. But using CloudBees Jenkins Jenkins platform gave us some of the things, uh, some technical capabilities that were not present in open source Jenkins. And there's some examples that I put here, like the Beekeeper uh, upgrade. Checker, so that gives us the ability to verify the incredibly, uh, integrity of plugins. Uh, it tells us version numbers of plugins and where we are. So when we do upgrades, it's, uh, we can be on the right version for different plugins. There's Cloudbees uh, Jenkins Operation Centers, which is CJOC, uh, which lets us control different masters in a centralized place. And it also lets us move jobs between masters. Older Plus plugin, which um, it's actually a improvement on the folders plugin, which I believe is open source now, but the folders plus plugin, what it does is it can restrict build agents to certain folders or it can set environment variables at the folder level. We could restrict uh, certain types of jobs that are created inside folders. And that kind of helps us to think about how we can make a self-service model because if we have isolation between folders, we can give different teams their own folders, and if they don't step on each other, they can kind of, there's more of a case to go about a self-service model there. Uh, RBAC, that allows us to integrate with our enterprise um, user repository, and the security advisors, which come out every once in a while. Uh, because Jenkins is based on plugins, a lot of them are open source, the security advisors help us to see where the CVEs are and when we should upgrade. And we also get the enterprise support with Jenkins, uh, which helps us a lot because the more we, the more we invest in Jenkins, the more we need support so that we don't have, um, go through any downtime. And Cloudbees support also helps us to uh, get focus guidance on our use cases, so we can ask more focused questions. Um, but we really use Jenkins to change our deployment practices, and the. The lead time diagram that we saw a few slides ago, what we were able to do is kind of convert that to this. And I always look at lead time uh, diagrams or value stream, value stream diagrams as, you know, if we massage that enough to a desired state, to what our desired value stream should be, it more or less resembles a deployment pipeline. And that's what we did. And this uh, image on the left is basically our deployment pipeline as it looks right now for most of the projects. You'll see there's a lot less blue and there's a lot more orange. So a lot more automation. We still do manual testing, but a lot more automation and earlier feedback. And the thing that allowed us to do that is the concept of a deployment pipeline. So that 30 minutes or two hours that we had became a single button click. Um, 
And what we were able to do is put all of those concerns into the pipeline and establish a single source of truth. We were able to visualize the flow of work and correlate feedback, reduce handoffs, and increase throughput at the same time. And what we recently started to do is take one step forward into that self-service model, and we started to look into allowing different development teams to create their own Jenkins pipeline so that they are not waiting on an admin team and there's no bottleneck as we grow and increase the number of pipelines. Um, the thing that we talked about earlier about tickets, that's also something that we're starting to improve. Um, um, the reason we have change management is obviously, you know, there's an important reason for that. There's lots of checks and controls that we are required to have to satisfy audit and compliance requirements. But at the same time, we need to move faster. So the problem becomes how do we seamlessly integrate change management with our continuous delivery practice? Uh, there was an example recently about a team that wanted to deploy about 30 or so applications into three or four environments, and they needed a ticket for each task. So they ended up creating 100 or so tickets, and that was a lot of time spent on the ticket creator's part and a lot of time spent on the ticket approver's part. So we're trying to see how we can incorporate change management into the JIT pipeline uh, while satisfying audit and compliance requirements while also capturing audit logs and traceability, but reducing the handoffs and reducing the amount of manual work that happens on different systems. So we're trying to bring even this into the same, into the same um, In the spirit of uh, you know, receiving faster feedback, we also started to focus a lot more on automation testing. And it wasn't just about unit tests and integration tests, it was acceptance test uh, framework. What we did was we started to create testing frameworks using behavior-driven development, and that helps both our older testing teams and any of the newer testers that we hire to build um, a concise testing environment using frameworks that were already built, so they didn't have to reinvent the wheel every time they needed to test something. Um, and we also integrated these tests into the pipeline. So these acceptance tests, like we talked about earlier, we, where we had smaller tests and bigger tests and bigger tests, we start to incorporate all of those into the pipeline. So our pipeline currently has multiple levels of tests. We have unit tests that take seconds. We have smooth tests that take minutes. We have acceptance tests that take hours. So we have a tiered testing approach. And some of the teams have even gone further and uh, made automation acceptance tests part of their definition of test. So that they have to have it and they have to pass the test as part of their definition of test. And infrastructure automation was also needed because as we were moving faster on the left, as we were churning out more applications faster, as we were able to um, create a lot more microservices and get feedback faster, we naturally needed a place to deploy those applications also faster. So we needed faster turnaround, and the speed at which we needed to provision and configure our infrastructure needed to match if not surpass the speed at which we created our application. And there was a lot of complexity um, with the manual process. There, were, there was a high probability of making mistakes. Uh, it was harder to keep environments in sync, especially since the environments uh, started to grow in size. So what we did was invested in infrastructure as code. And what we did was actually build uh, custom-made scripts and how we did look at a couple of tools and we continue to invest in tools. But as of today, most of the automation that our engineers built was done using in house scripts that they had created. And that made our configuration a lot more reliable and repeatable. So if we needed to change in our environment, we we're able to just change our scripts and run that instead of um, going to the server and changing something manually and creating configuration scripts. And I think the, the infrastructure as a code service, uh, for me at least, as a developer, was really awesome because I'm a developer and I think of everything as code. So being able to think about something as code that we previously didn't think of as code, I think that was a really uh, good journey. And this also gave us, like Courtney mentioned, um, it gave us the opportunity for Dev and Ops to collaborate earlier because the Ops guys who 
needed to provide a service, needed to know what that service was going to be earlier on so that they could work on it. And the other thing it also did um, was it allowed us to have better appreciation between dev and ops because devs had more visibility into ops and what they were doing, and ops became kind of more embedded into dev work. So this was a journey in itself, and I think it was a really cool journey. All right. So, thank you, Karan. So, here's a case study um, that kind of illustrates uh, the outcomes of all the efforts that we put in, um, you know, around um, culture change, around automation, around shifting left, um, you know, kind of how it influenced it. So, we had to do a Java version upgrade for our application. Uh, we were on Java 6 and we had to get to Java 8, and what that meant is our WebSphere application servers had to go to WebSphere version 9. And we have 100 plus applications on the stack, some of them mission critical, that is heavily used by our customer service reps, by our uh, you know, five and a half, five point three million members on using the web applications that we have, you know, and the APIs that uh, are used by a lot more of our uh, partners. So initially, um, it looked like a complex migration effort uh, when developers looked at it by themselves and when ops looked at it by themselves, it seemed like complex. When testing team looked at it by themselves, it seemed complex because you know, we thought that we would have to go in large batch size uh, into the environment um, and we'll have to, we have to go with in, in blocks of 30 applications based on which server hosted those applications, et cetera, et cetera. But what really happened is we got development, testing, and operation folks to sit together and plan this, right? And we decided to reimagine our approach. And then what resulted is we decided to leverage automation, and you know our environment team had to accelerate the automation to get to the finish line, but they committed to doing that. We figured out ways by which we could go in small batch size, meaning um, we are decoupling the different application uh, teams and different testing teams, and everyone can plan around their own specific milestones, and you know our infrastructure topology would allow that with the new reimagined approach. So we reduced coupling and dependencies across teams and allowed each team to plan separately, and that really made this a much more simpler effort than what we initially thought. And then we fostered a continuous improvement mindset where we decided to have regular retrospectives. We introduced Kanban into this mix, uh, an, agile uh, you know, an agile methodology, and we had daily stand-ups, um, and you know, we all looked at the Kanban board and talked about uh, daily issues and continuously improved. And what we saw at the end was the environments were de delivered in days, not weeks. Um, we were able to roll out in small batches. The complexity was much lesser. Uh, the testing effort was much more simplified, uh, and the timeline was cut in half. Next slide, please. And in addition to that, what we also saw is um, the teams that leveraged DevOps practices from the beginning, um, who had high levels of unit test coverage, who had uh, acceptance test case in a test scenarios automated, and all of them part of a regression suite, who had very low levels of technical debt measure through sonar, those teams we saw extremely fast cycle times. In fact, five to 10 times faster. Um, extremely high throughput. Um, and they had extremely high confidence in their work product because all of their um, upgrade efforts went through the automated unit test uh, you know, feedback loop and the automated regression test feedback loop, which is the same set of feedback loops that they used to go to production. So that really helped, and you know, it was a great lesson learned from this exercise. Next slide, please. Okay, so the last thing that we'll talk about, the um, last step that we'll talk about that was part of our journey is the culture. Uh, so as we were focusing on, on tools and methodologies, um, it was also important to focus on culture because we wanted our movement and everything that we did you know, to, to increase the chances of success, we needed the movement to have deep roots. And it needed, it needed to be a movement, not just from the top down, but from the bottom up. So people needed to feel like they're contributing and they're important and they're part of a bigger machine. Right? And some of the things we did to do that was, uh, you know, we, every, every tool that we invested in, we meant it to be a shared tool. So the Jenkins pipeline that we built, it's not just for the development 
open it's for everyone who can use it for their own purpose, uh, whether it's development, testing, or automation. Uh, we needed to build a culture of trust uh, and respect, mutual respect, not just across teams, but within teams. And one of the ways that we did that was, or we tried to do that was uh, with transparency. So allowing other people to see what's going on and having the reverse transparency into other teams and seeing what's going on there. Uh, allowing people to do self-service so that they don't just think that um, they're users of the system, right? Uh, they feel that they're actually part of the system and they can actually contribute. And like uh, we give an example of allowing the developers to create their Jenkins pipelines themselves. And that really empowers our team so that um, we're not just asking people to move forward with us. People actually want to move forward with us uh, together and solve problems together. And that, that's been a journey that we went through and continue to go through every day. All right, so um, some of the things that we're looking ahead, I mean, you know, just to recap, right, we, you know, we started this DevOps journey about two years back. Um, we have 60 plus applications on the deployment pipeline now. All of them have the ability to get push, push buttoned all the way to production. Um, most of these applications use infrastructure, at least elements of infrastructure that is provisioned through infrastructure as code for Vesphere and MQ products. Um, we, have, we still have a long way to go. Um, you know, so about 30 of these applications adopted the practices right from day one, uh, which means their unit test coverage is high, automated acceptance you know, uh, levels are high. Um, we run hundreds of continuous integration builds every month. Hundreds of deployments happen through the pipeline to lower environments on a monthly basis. So those are some of you know some of the data points around what we were able to achieve in these two years. But going forward, what we really want to do is we want to make sure, you know, we want to invest in enterprise work an option, uh, meaning there are other um, other applications, legacy applications, other other applications living on different tools that we need to pull into this pipeline and into this shift left, uh, you know, culture. And we want to continue to work with teams to embrace uh, the principles and practices. That is usually tough. It takes time. Um, and then um, we want to continue to work on improving the test coverage and reduce technical debt. Uh, we recognize that automation, automated tests is clearly one of the big ticket items that we need to solve to have agility. Um, and we also want to integrate various DevOps tracks uh, you know, to maximize the combined value. I mean, we have tracks around data. Uh, that's a tough one uh, to make sure that the database and those aspects get into the continuous delivery um, ecosystem. Security, we want to shift that left. We want to identify issues way early in the software development life cycle rather than catch it uh, later in a test environment. Uh, we want to bake monitoring into our processes and uh, we're also working on open source governance which we want to make sure that it, it that also gets tied into the CI CD pipeline. The other thing is the continuous improvement mindset. Uh, that is something that I think would uh, would live long beyond DevOps or Agile. That is something that we 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 are committed to, and we want we want to put more focus on X also, and the culture of experimentation and taking risks. Karan, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, the, basically the culture of experimentation and taking risks is allowing people and making it okay to take risks and making it okay to fail, and you know always. Um, doing experimentations, and because that's really the way to improve. If we always just settle for the things that we have, we don't make as much progress uh, as we would if we wanted to actually experiment and try new things. So be, being a culture where that is okay and failing is okay as long as we can recover, uh, that's really, that really helps us to mature at a faster rate. Okay. And with that, I think uh, we'll open it up for questions if there are any. All right. Uh, thanks, guys. Uh, if anyone has a question, please start putting into the question piece so we can, or the question panel, so that we can start answering them for you. Uh, Karan and Korean, do either of you have any questions that came through that you would like to uh, to answer? Um, 
Korean would you talk like to take a stab? Oh, here's one question. Um, how do you handle maintenance branches, if you have any, or long-term supported releases? We have many LTS branches to support. What's the best way to work off a of master and integrate back to many TLS branches? That's a good question. And it, it takes a lot of uh, practice to get into that mode. We, we, do, we don't really keep maintenance branches. What we do is so the UPS and what we do, what we try to do as much as possible is work off a of master and then use tagging to satisfy that. So once we have a release, uh, once we're close to release and once we have code base ready, we tag it. And then if there are any additional changes that need to happen in uh, addition to that tag, we create a branch off of that tag and then work on that branch. And then we integrate that branch and deploy it and then tag that and then merge that code back. But we don't really keep uh, maintenance long-term supported branches. Uh, we do have releases, but we, we create branches only when we need it. I hope that kind of helps answer that question. So yeah, so the, the model is that we work, we try to work off of master as much as possible and use branching and tagging as necessary to satisfy different releases. Um, how long, there's another question, how long time-wise did it take to make these changes so far? Um, I think so. From I think our agile journey started four years ago, but the the DevOps journey, which all with, with all these tools and modernization, started around May or June of 2015. So it took about two and a half years. Um, and like we talked about in the beginning, we are in the healthcare industry, so we don't always have the luxury of doing faster or as fast as someone else might, but we have to, there's a lot of internal processes that we have to meet to satisfy. So it took about two and a half years. Yeah, I want to add something to that. Um, you know, there is also a different approach we took when we decided to roll out these uh, capabilities to teams. Um, you know, the first thing is we have to select those tools, right? And we want to make sure that those tools fit into our uh, ecosystem and can integrate with our current tools, right? That's more like selection process, doing some proof of concept and stuff like that. We did not take a big bang approach in rolling out these tools to a lot of teams. What we did is we rolled it out to one small team first. We had one Agile team that started, uh, you know, beginning of 2016, and we started there. And then we worked with those engineers and, and test engineers and software engineers to make sure that, uh, you know, to address any of their concerns, to make sure that they were able to get value out of it, right? And some of these developers have been with the company for a while, some of them were new, but we did get a feedback from them whether these tools really made sense for us. I mean, is it really helping them deliver fast? Is it helping them ship left? Is it easy to use, right? And once we got those feedback and we tweaked uh, the tools, that's when we decided to go to more teams, right? So we took a, a slow approach because we wanted to get it right before we uh, completely change things on all the teams. And I think that helped um, in terms of making sure that uh, whatever we rolled out was stable and really got, you know, got, the, got the teams to uh, ship left and, and get fast feedback and get visibility and all the other stuff that we talked about. Here's another question. Um, how do you encounter resistance from development teams for CI? Um, so that, that's an interesting question. I wouldn't really call it resistance. I think there are some areas where there is friction. Uh, and one of the things we see from developers is uh, around branching. So as we try to move from a multi-branch model to a single branch model, that's where we see the most amount of work Necessary. So we find ourselves talking to our developers a lot about how you can actually work off of a single branch and that the requirements are really not that complex that require us to have too many branches. So that's one area where we see resistance. Karim, would you like to add to that? Yeah, the other thing we did is we worked with the teams and um, 
there is a see one ha one thing that happens is when you know when feature delivery versus intrinsic quality right that's a point of friction continuously if if the business teams want uh, are, are putting a lot more feature delivery into the teams that probably needs a little bit more time to to get to that level of agility and they have to invest in you know for example these practices i think it's uh, there is uh, work left on the management team to go and have those conversations and you know sh show a plan to get there right uh, because you want to make sure that um, you know because if, if the lean and agile principles you know you have to make quality in you know you cannot compromise and when i say quality it's it's intrinsic quality you know that's that's manifested by the, your, your high levels of unit test coverage high you know low very low levels of technical debt that is very important and um, so that there is work left. Uh, that is there is work cut out for management as well. There, that's that's one point I would like to make. Um, and the teams, I think, if you give them the time to do this, to get to a point where they have the ability to go fast, um, I, th I think it it would be easier to get teams to adopt it. And we also work with teams to make sure that these are part of the definition of done. So now they can plan for these when they go into their sprint planning cycle. They can really plan to have time to do those automations and to tackle those technical debt and to do acceptance testing. And the other thing we also did is we made sure that this is a collective team ownership. So if, if we have the automation test engineer falling a little bit behind, we want developers to go and support getting that story to a definition of done, which means they may have to start picking up some of that automation. Um, you know, things like that. So we made it more like a team level ownership rather than an individual level ownership. Um, and I think that's that hurt too. So one other question we got was, uh, are there any tips to talking upper levels of the company to adopt these types of things at an enterprise level up instead of in division? Uh, I think both of us can answer that. But one thing I have seen um, that helps is evidence. Right? So when you talk to upper levels of your company, um, what we have to make visible is proof and the value added to the business. Because if the developer teams are doing things faster and they're moving faster, uh, that's really not in itself adding any value to the business. So what some of the things that upper levels of an organization look for is what do we get out of it at the end? Right. So you can move faster, but how do we make that um, something beneficial for the entire company? Um, another question, how did you handle test failures at the system integration level where it is not clear which component change caused the issue, given that each component has a number of changes since the last successful test and teams are resistant, resistant to accept the ownership for the problem investigation? So basically, if I understand it correctly, um, how do you handle test failures at the integration level? where it could be caused by a different team. Um, I think one of the things we do is um, the, the faster integration, that helps a little bit. So when things are integrated faster, you know right away which commit or which sets of commit uh, cause the issue. We do have a lot of applications that are shared by different teams. And usually we are able to figure out um, faster rather than later what caused it. So, the blame, and I mean blame in the, the right sense of the word, the blame goes to the, the correct team earlier on. So the key, at least what we see is when we're doing integration testing, the key is doing it faster and earlier so that the right, so that we're testing finer grain commits and not bigger things. So that just kind of reduces the problem um, from the start. But it doesn't eliminate the problem for us. Uh, we do have cases where um, something happens in a later integration test or an acceptance test and something fails, it is not very clear. And there what we just do is we do traditional old-fashioned investigation, right? So we, we do figure out the root cause and we do assign it to the proper team. Right. So it's and kind of to balance. Go ahead, Korean. Yeah, and to improve that, right? Um, we haven't completely implemented it, but as our monitoring track you know, gets more traction, right? We expect to have the right level of, 
you know, information at the right application stack, right, from a monitoring standpoint, which would provide some of those alerts, right, as to what's happening. Um, I think, uh, you know, we've got we to take an engineering approach where it's not just built for features, it's also built for running this efficiently and troubleshooting eff efficiently, you know. That's a discipline that uh, I don't think we are perfect at. We have a long way to go there, but that's something that we want to intentionally focus on, right? How do we engineer this to uh, quickly troubleshoot issues, you know, uh, right level yeah, of loss, right catch. levels of monitoring, yeah. Yeah, the key is to catch it earlier. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. All right, so we are at the top of the hour. Um, there is one more that, if possible, I'd, I'd love to give just like a quick one, two minute answer. We could always take it offline if it needs to be longer than that. Um, so everyone doesn't mind, we're just going to take maybe one more minute. Uh, if you do have more questions, you can either put them here and I can collect them after, or I put my email in the chat box. But uh, Karan, if you want to take a look at that and just see if you think I might be able to give a quick overview. Sorry, what was the question? Oh, so it, sorry, it is. Uh, so dealing with internal is relatively easy. How do you align strategy process tools across multiple suppliers and delivery partners, especially given legacy sourcing and procurement models? Um, that's an excellent question. So basically the question is how do you align process tools across multiple suppliers and given different sourcing and procurement models? Um, Korean, would you like to tackle that one? Well, I don't think we have that scenario, at least in the 80% of the situations that we have. So we haven't really addressed it. Um, we have one scenario where you know, we have integration points with different partners. That's on our digital experience program. Um, but um, other than having a shared tool for um, authoring user stories, um, the only other um, common point is whether our services are available to them in a given environment on a given milestone, right? So we, we don't really worry about what tools we use internally on our side versus the supplier or vendor side, we worry about is the is the interface agreement you know being honored? Are those services available uh, based on the commitments that we made in our sprint planning or in our programming in our programming commitment planning? And if there are issues, what's the forum in which we can discuss them and take corrective measures? Right? Um, we haven't taken it to a place where we are sharing. Um, like for example, the Jenkins pipeline, right? And I don't, I don't think that's a good idea, also, because that might create a lot more dependencies than we want. Uh, I think the, here the idea is, um, you know, how do we make sure that we are able to invoke each other's capability? It could be services, it could be batch file transfers, whatever, honoring the interface agreement, and getting aligned on a delivery date, right? And having mechanism in place to really tackle any of the issues that come out. At least that's the way we have tackled it, yeah. Right. It, it helps if those external people that we work with uh, are also following Agile. The one thing that we see is some of those integration points, we're able to catch things quicker and evolve faster because our uh, customers in those scenarios are also following some kind of an Agile methodology. Okay. All right. Well, we are a little past the hour. I do want to just be respectful of everyone's time, including our speakers. So I just want to say thank you to everyone, uh, especially for those of you who have been on so many of these webinars this week in this series. And thank you to everyone just joining us for this one. And thank you to everyone in general. Uh, thank you to Karana Korean for the uh, great presentation. Thank you to everyone for the great questions that we got. Uh, like I said, my email is in the chat window. Feel free to email me for anything else. And uh, and that has been it for this series. Uh, Karana Korean, is there anything you want to say real quick at the end, or are you all, you all set? Well, thank you so much for listening to us. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, everyone. We will see you soon. Bye.